this one. A sweet water package. I'm gonna be building one of my favorite rigs. Hello and welcome Sweetwater to my garage workshop here in Oakland, California. We just got our delivery of all the Sweetwater goods that we're going to be using today to build a pedal board for some of my favorite tones. Now I'm a huge John Mayer, SRV, Kenny Wayne Shepherd fan and I really want to build a rig that encompasses some of my favorite tones and I had the help of Sweetwater and their gracious team and sales engineers to send me some pedals so that I could put together a rig that exemplifies my favorite tones and the stuff that I go for. So let's talk about some of the things that we're going to be putting on this rig. First thing is a Boss TU3. It's not the fanciest of tuners, but it's definitely proven itself as a reliable entity. Anybody who's used one can tell you that it's absolutely bulletproof. We're going to be putting that on this rig today. Second thing that we're going to be putting on is the J Rocket Audio Designs Archer. Now this is one of my favorite Quan clones. It's not the cheapest one out there, but it definitely delivers on the tone if you're looking for a vintage, true, correct sounding Quan style pedal. I love it. It's small, easy to place on a pedal board. Definitely check that one out if you haven't already. Next thing on the rig, we have the mini Tube Screamer. If you love the sound of a Tube Screamer, just like I do, I believe that they're all good. This one definitely delivers on the classic Tube Screamer sound in a nice, small, compact package. An absolute must if you want to go for that John Mayer, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Kenny Wayne Shepherd type tone. You need a high quality Tube Screamer and this one definitely delivers in spades. Next we have the EP Booster. Whenever you have those great crunch tones that you've established, that you already got cooking and you want to go a little bit more over the top, nothing's going to do it better than a nice quality clean boost that's nice and compact like the EP Booster. It's going to take whatever you have and just boost that level up a little bit more to push you over the edge. I love that pedal for that exact purpose. Then we have our steel string clean drive. It wouldn't be a John Mayer or an SRV type rig unless you had a little Dumble clean flavor in there. And our steel string pedal is designed exactly to do that. It encompasses the vibe of the Dumble steel string singer, puts that into a box, and by running that after all the overdrives, it kind of creates that amp-like essence just as though you're running those pedals into the front of a Dumble clean style amplifier, just like the steel string singer amplifier, which again, our pedal is modeled after. All that is then going into a high quality analog delay. This analog delay is the Mini Ibanez one and it is absolutely outrageously good. Reminds me of the old Ibanez AD80 which is very similar to the DM2 or the Aquapus that you would see guys like John Mayer using for a little slapback. And this one sounds great, has nice cool audio, BBD chips, fully analog, can't go wrong there. And I'm also going to make a little special customization because it wouldn't be a Rig Doctor video without a little extra sauce on there. I'm going to do a couple of things that are a little bit out of the norm that's not something you can just get off the shelf at Sweetwater. The first thing is I'm going to take our pedal train pedal board that we're going to be putting this on and I'm actually going to build a custom platform to go over that. I really like to be able to build everything top side as though it was a flat board. So I have access to all the cables, I have access to all the wiring. And in troubleshooting, I don't have to go back and forth between the top and the bottom in order to make sure that I have everything working. It's just a much easier format for me to be able to assemble with. So we're going to be putting everything on the top. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to build a custom interface that's going to allow me to have all my inputs and outputs centralized to one place on the pedal board. I like doing this because it reduces stress on any of the pedals by having to plug in and out of them gives me a place to do that separately so the pedals all stay intact and the wiring on the board all stays intact and it has a centralized place where all my cables are coming in and out of so I'm also going to be making that and adding that to the pedal board. But enough of me talking about it, let's get into it. I'm going to start doing the layout, we're going to go into power, then audio, and then hear how this thing sounds. I can't wait to get started, let's do it. To begin any rig, one of the most important things is establishing the layout. Now we have a finite amount of space to work here with the Metro 16. So what I want to do is I'm going to put all of my connectors in the pedals themselves. So for example, in this Boss Tuner, I've put in my right angle connectors that I'm going to be using. I'm also going to put in one of the pre-made power cables that I'm actually going to cut down to length that was provided with the True Tone power supply. 
What this is going to do is it's going to tell me exactly how much space this is going to occupy once it's connected on the board. And I'm going to repeat this with all of the pedals. I'm going to put jacks in them. I'm going to put them roughly where I want them to be on the board. That way I can ensure that the spacing that I'm going to be putting them in in the layout is going to be reflective of the size that they're going to be once they're down so that I don't have any problems with fit and I don't have any problems with routing once I start bringing in power cables and audio cables into the pedals themselves. So this is kind of the approximate layout that I've come up with. I have my custom made interface in the corner. This is what everything's going to plug in and out of. First pedal I have in the chain is going to be my Boss TU3. I'm going to skip over the steel string because this is a little bit too deep to put in its order in terms of the sequence. So after the tuner, it's going to go into the Mini Tube Screamer, to the Archer, to the EP Booster. Then it's going to go back to the steel string, analog delay, and then it's going to go back to the interface to go out to the amplifier. So that's kind of what we have in mind. And as you can see, I've already started to put in all of the plugs into the jacks of each one of the pedals. I'm also going to take the additional cables that I have for DC. I'm going to put them in the pedals themselves, make sure that kind of my rough kind of layout is going to be workable with this. And then I'm going to start to apply dual lock Velcro. Now dual lock, which is what we're going to use to put the pedals onto the pedal board is something that you can talk to your Sweetwater sales engineer about and exactly where to get it, the length that you might need. I usually say to approximate about a foot per pedal in terms of length of what you need for each one of these pedals. So I say that's a, roughly about what you need. If you have a smaller pedal, like say this Tube Screamer, you might be able to get away with six or eight inches, a little less than the normal size pedal. So just keep that in the back of your mind when you're trying to calculate how much you might need. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna put the, the DC power cable in each one of these. We're gonna see what our sizing looks like and then I'll show you how I apply the dual lock velcro. All right, so all of the connectors are in, all the DC audio cables, everything is in. So I kind of know roughly how much space I need to accommodate. And it looks like I was about right in terms of my placement of everything. My TU3 needs to be a little bit pushed in from the edge, and that's just because my jack for the send here is a little bit tight, and I don't want to put any stress on that DC jack. So I'm in a little bit from there, but otherwise it looks like I have ample room for everything else to fit perfectly onto the board. So now I'm going to show you my technique for adding dual lock. Now I want to show you on a boss pedal because I think that this is probably one of the more complicated pedals to add dual lock to. On the bottom of most boss pe pedals, ordinarily you'll have this rubber uh, kind of tread that's on the bottom. This is just to kind of give it a little bit more of a traction against a, a flat surface that might be kind of slippery. I recommend not applying dual lock to this. What I recommend doing is peeling it away and I'm pulling it off. Now, this is not a great surface to try to apply Velcro to. Some of the adhesive is still stuck on there because they are using a fairly high quality adhesive for this particular application. So this is a trick that I like to do on boss pedals that not a lot of people are aware of. First, what you're going to do is you're going to remove your four screws. Once you've done that, you're going to take the bottom and you're simply just going to flip it over. Now you have a beautiful clean surface that you can mount your Velcro to and it's not going to have any issues with sticking. It's perfectly clean, no issues whatsoever. It's going to go in nice and easily. We can just screw this right back on exactly where we found it. All right, so now to the dual lock part. So what I'm going to do to the dual lock is I'm going to use the pedal itself to kind of create my spacing. I don't need to go overlapping the pedal. In fact, it tends to not look very good if you do that. And functionally, there's no more benefit. So I usually try to keep it cut in slightly from the edge. So as you can see, if I were to lay this flat, it's not going all the way to the edge. It's maybe inset, maybe a quarter of an inch. And for something like this, two strips will be more than enough per side. I'm going to put that one there, that one there. Make sure that it's on there nicely. Next thing I'm going to do 
is I'm going to take the exact same Velcro and I'm just going to mirror what I already cut. And I'm going to kind of loosely put that in place over what I already have. So I can make sure that the Velcro is going to be mirrored on both sides so they get a nice adhesion to the board. Okay, so I have that already pre-cut. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ensure that I'm in the placement that I want before I actually go to stick it down. So I'm going to put back in my jacks, make sure I'm in the place that I want to be. And one thing you can do is you can take a pencil and just kind of just barely trace out kind of the edges. So I kind of know my rough area where it's going to be. I'm going to peel off the adhesive and I'm just going to line up with my pencil markings. And I'm just going to wiggle in it making sure that the bottom side is stuck. And now I have that exactly where I need it to be on the bottom. It's mirrored to the top. I'm going to line it back up and with dual lock you'll hear the lock. And this isn't going anywhere. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to repeat with all the other pedals, make sure that they're in place, following the exact same technique. I won't have to peel off the bottom of them like I did on the boss pedals. These are a little simpler in that regard, but I thought I'd show you the most difficult one, and then we work to the easiest ones from there. Now you may have noticed that this doesn't look quite like a normal pedal train. From the front, it has all the normal aesthetics, but I actually have a flat piece of machined aluminum that's about one eighth of an inch right on the top. And the idea here is that it kind of closes up some of those channels that are normally on the bottom of a pedal train to give us a little bit more surface area to route. Now, I'm not a big proponent of putting the power supply underneath. I know that some people do like that. But in this particular case, we have the room to be able to fit our power supply, which is the True Tone CS6, right in the corner without any imposition. And I really like that from a troubleshooting perspective because everything is top mounted. I can see where all my wires are going, and if I do need to make an adjustment, change a cable, or do anything that's related to the reliability of the pedal board, I have access to everything. I don't have to be going back and forth. So just a quick note on the fact that we did change that. I had this custom made. This wouldn't be a rig doctor rig without a little bit of extra sauce on the pedal board. So just want to let you know that we did that. If you decided that you wanted to do something like this on your pedal train, but wanted to have your power supply mounted underneath, I would recommend mounting your power supply and then drilling your holes that you want the power cables to exit from underneath. So then that way, if you do make a mistake or there is some accidental damage in drilling, it's not going to show through the top side of your nice clean pedal board. So just a tip on that. One more thing I should mention before I start really getting these guys dual locked down is many of our pedals and devices will come with batteries internally. Now, it's a good idea to make sure that you remove these before you put anything on the board. Not only does it decrease the weight, but it also can prevent a short. I have seen instances where battery clips that are floating freely next to the PC board can cause a short. Now, in this particular case, in the Boss pedal, not so much of an imposition, but on a lot of our other pedals, you'll see examples of battery clips that are open and next to components. This is a good way to just to make sure that they don't obstruct anything. So what I like to do is you can either tape it off with electrical tape, or what I like to do is I just take a tiny piece of heat shrink and cut it just a little longer than the battery clip is itself. I put it over the lead. And then I'll take my heat gun and I'll just heat it up. And that's just a really easy way to make sure that you're not risking a short. Now in, in the boss pedals, very unlikely because it's in its own little protected compartment. But in some of these, you'll see the battery clips right next to various circuitry, even in some cases the power supply and things like that. We just want to keep it safe as we can, and this is just an easy, foolproof way to be able to make sure that that's not going to happen. You're not going to get any short. Due to that reason, again, you don't need to use heat shrink. You could use electrical tape. I'm just doing it that way because I think it's a, it's a little cleaner application, and if you do need to use a battery with the pedal somewhere down the road, you can easily just cut it away, and you can have it available to you. So the next thing we need to do is we actually need to physically wire in the cables for the DC power into our one spot supply. 
Now I'm going to use the provided cables that come with the True Tone power supply. And this is a really common practice that I would do even on my own pedal boards on the Rig Doctor YouTube channel where I'm showing tutorials like this all day long. The thing that I like to use is something called a Kobicon connector. And this is Kobicon is the brand. It's a 2.1 millimeter by 2.5 millimeter barrel connector that I can solder on to the existing power cable. So I'm going to cut the power cables provided by True Tone to length, and I'm going to re-terminate with this on the power supply end. And the reason why I'm doing it at the power supply end is this is relatively protected. And so once I put it together, it's not going to be disrupted. The end that is molded is a little bit more robust, so I'm going to leave those on the pedals just in case somebody decides that they want to change pedals out some point down the road. They have a kind of a, a more roadworthy version on the pedal side, and the part that's really protected is on the power supply. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do that. I'm going to show you how I do one, and then I'm just going to go through quickly and do the rest of them. So let's practice on one. So I'm going to start over on this side where I have my EP booster because my Archer, my kind of clone clone and the EP booster are really close to these two. So I'll be able to actually wire those in pretty easily. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use some tie down mounts. These are something you can get at most hardware stores all across the country or local to you. I'm getting the smaller three quarter inch size bases, but you could use one inch size bases just as well. Another place where it's really easy to get if there's any sort of marine supply for boating is another place where you'll find these types of tie down mounts and zip ties. So I'm just going to use this as sort of my guide as I go into the power supply. I'm going to use this to kind of help me keep the cables in place so that they're not moving around. Once assembled, some nice long needle nose pliers that kind of allow me to get into some of the small nooks and crannies. Cool, I got one down. Cut away that excess. I might put one more in there. And I might even loop my EP booster cable back a little bit so if for some reason somebody changes this to something else that has a different assignment in terms of where the DC power lives, that they can maybe reach that on the side. So let me throw one more on there. The Archer I have a little less uh, fle flexibility with because of its position. I can't really manipulate uh, how the DC cable dresses. There are some pedals where we'll have slightly less flexibility in what we do with the uh, routing of the DC power cables or the audio cables depending on where the jacks are and how close in proximity they are to each other. So I have them nicely wired in there and I don't know how well you can see I'll move the power supply back so you can get a little better sense. So you can see that they're nicely wired in there. I've given myself a little bit of play on the side there of the EP booster just so if I have a pedal later on and it needs to come out and let's say go over to this side or I can cut it away and go to this side if I need to. Just gives it some flexibility if for some reason whoever ends up with uh, this pedal board will be able to do that. So now I'm going to put my power supply roughly back in place where I'm going to have it once the board is assembled so that I can route this perfectly into the respective 2.1 millimeter barrels. What I like to do is I take off the housing so I can see exactly what my spacing needs to be in order to fit in with as much precision as possible. And I like to like lead the cable physically into where it's going to live. And it looks like we're going to be right about there. It gives me almost a perfect, perfect routing. It looks pretty, pretty precise to me. So what I'm going to do now that I have this placement, I know exactly where it's going to live. I'm going to strip this off. I'm going to solder it in to the power supply plugs there, the 2.1 millimeter uh, connectors. And uh, we'll be done with the power for the Archer and the EP. We'll test, of course, but uh, let's see how this goes. Last step here, now that I've assembled them, 
it's just to put together a, uh, a zip tie around the housing. This is just to make extra sure that nothing's going to go wrong in the, uh, the heat of the gig. Just gives me a little extra rigidity there. And to kind of show you what it's going to look like when it's dressed in. This is the vibe right there. Nice and flush. In fact, I'll even get a little bit more of a flush cut on that uh, zip ties there. And that is, uh, that is going to be pretty reliable for whoever it's going to. And that's going to be sitting in there just fine. It just clears the edge here. So uh, it's going to be the same thing I'm going to do. I'm going to repeat it with all the rest of the power cables on the opposite side of the one spot. Get them all soldered in and we'll test that to make sure all of our power is going good and then we'll move on to audio. All right, so we got everything in place. I got everything, as you can see, nicely dressed in to the power supply. No excess cables falling off. It's making it real pretty, but it's gonna be all for nothing if it doesn't all power up. So I'm just gonna do a quick check on that. Take my IEC cable. Fingers crossed, everything comes on. Looks like we got everything coming on. We got our LEDs illuminated. That's telling us that we're getting power to everything. I like to also kind of shake the cables a little bit, kind of get in there, rough them up, just to make sure that my connections are solid. I don't have anything intermittent. And once I know that I'm good, at least to this point, what I'll do is I'll label my power supply. So if I ever have a problem down the road, I know exactly which output corresponds to which pedal. So I'll take out my label maker and I'll just make the names of each one of my pedals. All right, so I'm just labeling everything exactly where it was, just double checking that that's what I have power going to, just by unplugging it, making sure. I'm going to put the name next to each one of my outputs. I know this guy's Archer. This is just a good thing to do for troubleshooting purposes. You always know where things are, or if somebody's working on the board that's not you, they can be really clear where things are going. Perfect. So we've got everything labeled. We know where everything is. This is going to be a good troubleshooting tool for us if we ever need to do anything later on or down the road. We know where everything is on the power supply. We're now ready to move in to audio. We've completed our power and everything is looking good. Testing nicely. We can see we have powered everything nicely. No issues whatsoever so far. Now I did want to just point out that I did make one change. I was on the uh, John Mayer forums last night on Facebook and I was reminded that the order between the Klon and the Tube Screamer I had wrong so I went and I reversed the order of those two things this will make sure that we have it in the correct order to be able to get the signature tone as closely as we possibly can now what we're going to move on to are the audio cables and as you can see I've already put in all of the plugs so I kind of know the rough orientation of where things need to be but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come in with some Mogami cable and I'm actually going to solder in to each one of these Switchcraft style pancake plugs the cables themselves. I'm going to show you how I do one and then we're just going to copy that through the rest of them so you know my technique, exactly how I'm doing it, how I'm determining lengths. And this just helps keep everything nice and clean so I don't have excessive lengths where I have to kind of figure out what to do with the extra cable. This will give you a really nice way to make sure that every cable comes out nice and clean and is exactly the length that you need. So let's check that out. All right, so I have a few pieces of my raw Mogami cable. This is something that you can ask your Sweetwater sales engineer about. This is all sold in bulk at Sweetwater, so you can get that in addition to the Switchcraft pancake style quarter inch plugs that we're gonna be using today. So my technique is this. What I'm gonna do first is I, is I actually open up the plugs a little bit so that I have enough room to actually slide the cable all the way through to the top. Now that might be a little bit longer than it's actually going to end up being, but it's such a slight amount that it doesn't typically end up being a problem at all. So what I do is I slide that all the way to the top. I get the cable in the orientation that I want it, and I'm actually going to slide it in 
to the reciprocal plug on the opposite end and slide it in so that I can cut it to the exact same length. So I've slid this one in. I know about how long that needs to be. I'm going to cut preliminarily about what I think it needs to be, maybe a little bit longer since I can uh, always cut it shorter, but I can't make it longer once I cut it. And on this side, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to slide all the way to the top. Now it looks like it's a little long. We can see here that the cable is sticking out the top. So I'm going to trim off just a little more and just kind of do this incrementally. Still a little bit too much, do a little more. And I'm leaving a little bit of slack here too because if for some reason you changed your tuner in the future, I like to wrap it under here. So if for some reason the plug was had a different orientation or you changed the pedal that went here and the jacks are further down or further up or on the top, it would give you some flexibility to be able to move this around and not be locked into this exact position. But this looks about what I want. Maybe I'll take just a little tiny bit more off. Feed that through. And that looks about right. That looks about how I want it. And I'll probably do one zip tie here just to fasten it. But this looks like it's about the right size that I want. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm actually going to do that with every single one of the cables so that I know exactly what it is. Now the next thing I'm going to do so I don't lose track of this, I'm going to take a piece of painter's tape or any type of tape that you can write on. I'm going to tape it to the cable and I'll just write on it with some Sharpie exactly what it's going to. So I'm going to write send since it's coming from the send here and on the opposite end I'm going to write TNR for tuner. This way I know exactly that it's coming from the send, it's going to the tuner, and so that I don't lose track of what this cable goes to once I make it. So this is, it just allows me to keep a certain amount of consistency throughout. I don't lose track of what the cable is and I make all of them to length. So I'm going to go ahead, repeat that, and then I'll show you my soldering technique. So I now have all of my cables labeled. I know what they're going to. I know where they're going. I'm gonna move the pedal board out of the picture. And now it's time for us to focus on our soldering technique. So now we're ready to go into soldering the cables together. I wanna to show you one of the things that I like to do for prep before I even get started soldering. Right over here on my bench, I have couple of different groupings that I've made and I've put heat shrink in one, I've put the plug itself in another, I've put all the screws and hardware also in separate bins. This just makes it easy for me to keep track of everything in one place and reassemble it easily. Now you may be asking yourself why is this heat shrink so small? The only thing that we're trying to protect against with any of these cables and any of these plugs is just eliminating lateral movement. And since in this particular type of plug, the Switchcraft style, there's not a lot of protection against lateral movement. It doesn't have a clamp or any sort of real strain relief. That's what we're trying to eliminate here to give it a little bit more rigidity. I'll show you more on how I do that in just a moment, but let's get into it. So here's one of my cables that's gonna be going to the steel string and EP booster. First thing I wanna do is I'm gonna strip out this outer insulation. I'm using about a 12 gauge or so uh, stripper on this part. I'm stripping out not not a, a whole lot. You can probably say this is about a half inch or so. I'm going to braid the shield together. And this is just a spiral shield on Mogami cable so it's pretty easy to deal with as opposed to a braided shield. So I'll make sure I get it all together. I braid that all together. Get it nice and tight. Now this is the part where most people go wrong when they're soldering Mogami cable. There is a black uh, thermal conductive plastic that covers the center conductor. This needs to be removed completely. You can do it with a tool, but I actually think it's pretty easy to do it with just your fingers. And all you're doing is exposing the center conductor beneath it. There's still a nice uh, insulation around that that's clear, but you want to get as rid of, of as much of that as possible. That is the kiss of death. If you solder that, it's going to put a load on the signal about 5k. So this is just a good plan just to get rid of it so you don't see it anymore. And then I'm just going to just take a little bit of the insulator off just to expose a little bit of my center conductor. 
So once I've done that, I'm now going to clamp it in my vise or my third hand. I'm going to take my soldering iron and I have it right around maybe 650 degrees and I'm going to tin the wire. And so this is just a fancy word of saying I'm going to pre-solder it, just getting it ready and prepped. And then I'm going to take the housing, the actual plug itself, and I'm going to solder the solder lugs on here for the tip and the sleeve. So I'm just going to touch a little solder to that, got a little solder on the tip, a little on the sleeve. Perfect. Now what I'm going to do before I start soldering together is I'm going to use two pieces of heat shrink. Now depending on the thickness of your heat shrink, you may not need to use two pieces. One might suffice, or you might need three if it's a really thin heat shrink. I've already pre-measured this, and so I know that I need two pieces in order for this to work. So what I'm going to do first is I just put the heat shrink on there just so I have it ready to go in advance. And I'm going to kind of size up where I need to put my tip and my sleeve and I'm just gonna solder that down. That's perfect for the tip. And I got a little extra of the shield wire there for the sleeve, so I'm gonna cut off my excess. I'm gonna kind of bend it into place. I'm just gonna press down on that. Perfect, got a little extra sticking off there on the, uh, the tip, so I'm gonna get rid of that. I have a nicely wired cable there. That's my first end. It's looking pretty good. I'm happy with that. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the heat shrink and I'm, I'm not trying to cover anything as much as I'm just trying to create a little rigidity. So I'm going to heat shrink one piece on and I'm going to move the second piece up and heat shrink that on as well. The first piece, just making sure that I don't have anything too hot. I like, I like using embossing guns like this for paper because I find that you have a big threshold where you're not going to kill any of your cables because it doesn't quite get hot enough knowing that it's going to paper. Uh, the propensity to burn is high, so these don't get too hot, but they work really well for heat shrinking uh, cables, especially small patch cables like this. Perfect. So as you can see, it's not sticking out a whole bunch. Again, I don't really have any value functionally of having it stick out any more than that. Again, it's just to kind of give me some rigidity. I'm going to line this up, same piece. That's the first one. Just line those up. Perfect. I'm going to undo it now and just give it one more, one more turn. Perfect. Now I'm going to take the back of my housing. Might even put it back here since it'll be a little easier for me to put back together. Now we have one perfectly soldered end. It's exactly as I want it. I have my heat shrink, two pieces there, adding enough rigidity where there's no lateral movement anymore in the plug. Again, on these types of connectors, you don't have any strain relief clamp. It's really just relying kind of on these, these kind of teeth there on opposing sides to hold together. And the heat shrink just adds an extra layer of protection so that there's no movement in there. Again, I could have actually cheated this heat shrink up quite a bit if I wanted to, but I just have a little bit sneaking out there just so people can tell that there is some heat shrink there in case somebody needs to service it or they need to know that for any reason. I'm just cheating it out a little bit, but honestly, from a functional standpoint, I could have buried it a lot more into the housing if I wanted, but this is exactly the technique I'm gonna to use to solder all the other cables. So I'm gonna do that real fast. We're gonna test all the cables. I'm gonna show you how I do that. And then we're gonna do a sound check, see how this thing sounds. So I have all of my cables ready to go. I've soldered them all up, then all the heat shrink, I have them all labeled. But the thing I wanna do before I start to implement them onto the board is I always wanna do a test. Now I have two different ways that I can test here. One of them is an easy way that doesn't require you to have any instruments out of the ordinary in order to test your cables. It's actually from True Tone and they make a one spot cable tester. And this is a really easy way if you don't wanna invest in a multimeter to be able to test your cables there are some other manufacturers that also make cable testers, but this is a really small compact one that I think is pretty easy to use and also doubles as a current reader 
you wanted to see how much current your pedals were drawing, this could be a good thing to use if you need that feature. I'm gonna show you how to do it both ways. So I've set my multimeter to ohms, and firstly what I should be seeing, I'm gonna clip the tip of both sides with my alligator clips here, and I should be reading zero. So right now we can see I'm reading zero, just right around there. And then I should also be reading zero when I go to the respective sleeves of each. Also reading zero there. I can also use the buzzing feature of the multimeter and I should be able to get a buzz if I have connection equally with the sleeves. Perfect. Now, if I were gonna be using the cable tester, I would just go from one side to the other, and if it works, I'll see that it reads blue. If there's a problem, then it just won't illuminate. So this is just telling me that this cable works. I'm gonna go ahead and repeat with all my other ones. Of course, a sound check is the absolute best way to determine whether a cable is working, because this doesn't tell you the quality of the connection, or if you wiggle it and there's an intermittent, it won't tell you that. So you definitely do still want to do a sound check to this, but this is a good baseline to start with before you start getting cables and integrating them onto the system. So I'm going to repeat with all these and then we'll put them back on the pedal board. So they all checked out at least fine on our cable tester here. And you know how to do it both ways. Now, if you use something like a one spot cable tester from True Tone or using your own multimeter, you can do it either way. Again, you just want to make sure you test them before they go on. So if there's any problems, you can identify that, fix the problem, and then integrate it onto the board just so you're doing your due diligence. Let's put it back on the board and we'll see how it looks. Make sure that everything is coming together nicely and then we'll go to a sound check. All right, our pedal board is now complete. So now that we have the board together, I can see that it actually is working. One thing I like to do is I like to strum just a chord and I like to actually rattle the cable pretty rough just to make sure that there aren't any intermittents. There's nothing that might have gone wrong with the cable itself or with the housing or with the plug. Kind of wiggle, wiggle the, the connector, make sure I don't hear any sort of intermittent connection. I'm gonna do the same on down the line. Don't hear anything there. The other thing I want to do is I want to do the same to the power. Now in some of these, because they're true bypass, even if the power disconnects when they're off, you won't hear anything. So I'll engage the pedal, I'll wiggle the DC jack, make sure we don't have any intermittent there. Everything is sounding as it should. It's all checking out so far. Again, this is the best you're gonna be able to do to be able to cause a failure. You wanna to try to induce it as much as you can by shaking the cables, both the DC and the audio, making sure that there aren't any intermittent issues, that maybe some of the housings uh, of the cables or the actual connection of the quarter inch uh, plugs internally is correct, because sometimes you'll solder it up, everything will test okay when it's on the multimeter on your cable tester, but you get it into practice and it actually is not making a full connection. So this is a good way to kind of root that out and make sure that you have something that you know resembles the sound of your amp, even though you're going through a grouping of pedals like this. And I have to say, we're pretty dang close right now. It sounds great. It's nice and quiet, just as we wanted it. We've got a nice high quality switch mode power supply with the True Tone and all you know great pedals. Not all of them are of the highest budget, but they're all great in their own right. And I think really do a great job of kind of getting the 
Stevie Ray, John Mayer type vibe, which is what I really go for and what I really love. But let's hear it in a studio context, see how it really sounds when we're going through the paces with a real pro, not just an amateur like me. So let's go to the studio, check it out. So that was our rig build for the John Mayer, kind of SRV, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, kind of the ultimate sort of blues rock board, keeping it simple, getting all the core tones that I really like to get those types of sounds that those players have. Now, if you're interested in any of these devices that we used on the pedal board, the power supply, the pedals, the cables, the connectors, any of that stuff is all available on Sweetwater's website. So do talk to your Sweetwater sales engineer 
whether you want to spend a little bit more, they're going to be able to give you some options that are maybe higher price point versions than what we had on the board, as well as some lower price point options. So really you can seek whatever device you need in order to fit your budget, and that's going to keep you kind of in the realm of the tones that we were showcasing today with this pedal board. If you want to check out more tutorials like we did today in this pedal board build, please do go over to our channel, Vertex Effects, and check out some of the tutorials that we have. They're very similar in what we did today, but a lot of times we're working with well-known professional artists and showcasing their rigs and showing you some cool tutorials. And other parts are just around best practices of building cables or which cables sound the best in blind shootouts, all kinds of things like that that are gonna help you optimize your tone for your pedal board and give you the very best results that you're seeking in trying to achieve the tone that you hear in your heads and translating that to a pedal board. So do go check that out on the Vertex channel. I also want to invite you to subscribe to Sweetwater's channel if you haven't already. Give us a like and a comment below if there was a particular part of the video today that stood out to you or questions that you have for me or for Sweetwater on how you can best achieve some of the things that we capture today in this pedal board or anything else that may come to mind. Until next time, I'm Mason Marangella, the Rig Doctor. See you later. Thank you.